Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to talk about the NTFS Master File Table, or MFT. First, let's start with the basics. Reading from this Microsoft article, the NTFS file system contains a file called the Master File Table, or MFT. There is at least one entry in the MFT for every file on an NTFS file system volume, including the MFT itself. All information about a file, including its size, time and date stamps, permissions, and data content is stored either in MFT entries or in space outside the MFT that is described by MFT entries. So for all intents and purposes, the MFT is a database. The records within the database are usually 1024 bytes long, but can occasionally be 4096 bytes long for advanced format or AF drives with 4K sectors. The records begin with the ASCII string file, F-I-L-E, or 4649-4C-45. Though a record with an error would begin with B-A-A-D, or 42414144. In order to really understand the structure of the MFT, we're going to take a look at an exported copy within a hex editor. Now, don't worry, we're not going super in-depth here, at least not in this episode. This is not an academic research paper, but we'll at least look at the main building blocks of an MFT record to include the standard information and file name MACB timestamps, the file name itself and size, and other metadata. In my opinion, this will help reinforce the concepts you've probably heard mentioned over and over again. It's one thing to hear it described and another entirely to actually pull back the curtain and look behind the scenes. And there may actually be a time where you will want this lower level of information to be able to perform a more complete analysis of a system. So let's get started. We're currently looking at an exported copy of the MFT from this lab machine opened within a hex editor. For reference, this is the 010 editor by Sweetscape Software, not sponsored, which is one of my personal favorites, but any hex editor will do. We're specifically looking at a single MFT file record or entry for 13cubed.txt, which was a small text file I created on the desktop of my user on this system. Now we aren't going to cover every single structure within this record, but we will cover most of them, especially the ones that will be most recognizable and useful to you. Starting with the red highlighted bytes 46494C45. That's the signature for an MFT file record. And if we scroll down to the end of this one, guess what? The start of the next one will have those same sequence of bytes. Next, let's talk about standard information, which is certainly a structure that I'm sure you've heard of and are familiar with. That section starts with the bytes 10, 00, 00, 00, 00. So that's the start of the standard information structure within this MFT file record. And of course, within that, it stands to reason that we should find those standard information MACB timestamps. They aren't in the same order, but they're all here, starting with the birth or creation. And you can see that red series of bytes highlighted right there. That's actually a 64-bit Windows file time structure. But if we convert it to a time format you'll recognize, there you go. We get a standard date and time that reflects the creation of this file, the point at which I right-clicked on the desktop and chose new text document. Upon doing that, I opened it with Visual Studio Code and modified the contents, actually typing some text that we'll talk about below. And you can see the modification time, if we convert it to a standard format, is this timestamp. So that's the modification. Next up, we have the C, which again stands for MFT Record Changed, which reflects a metadata change. And you'll see as I highlight this that it's different than the other two timestamps. And the reason for that is because of something called an extended attribute that was applied to this particular file, but we'll talk about that in a bit. If we convert it like the others, it's a standard time that you'll recognize. And then last up, we have the A timestamp, which reflects the access time, or as I like to call it, the most useless timestamp in Windows, because there are just too many ways the access time could be updated. But there it is. And if we convert that access time to a standard time, there you go. So those are the MACB timestamps, albeit in a different order within standard information. And of course, the modification, creation, and access timestamps are the very ones exposed to the Windows Explorer, the ones that most users are used to seeing and interacting with. Okay, so what's next? You've heard of standard information, of course. Well, what about file name? 
There you go. That series of bytes marks the start of the file name structure, 30000000. So of course, we're going to talk about the MACB timestamps within the file name structure. And it turns out they're in that same order that they were in with standard information, which would again have a start with the B birth. And there's that timestamp. Once again, if we convert it, it's this time. And then as before, we have the next three timestamps in the order of modification, which you'll note is the exact same timestamp. Then after modification, we have the MFT record change, which again is the same timestamp. And then lastly, the access time, which again is the same timestamp. Why are they all the same? Well, take a look at this poster from SANS and you'll see that upon the modification of a file, none of those timestamps should be updated in the file name structure and that holds true. They weren't updated. They were set to the time the file was created and weren't subsequently modified. Okay, so what's next? Well, next up, we have the size information associated with the file. And there's actually a couple of different things that track that. The first one is the allocated size, and you'll see that it's all zeros. This is typically a multiple of the NTFS cluster size, which is 4096 bytes or 4K by default. In this case, it's zero because this is a resident file. And as a reminder, a resident file is a file less than six to 700 bytes or so, such that the entire contents of the file could fit inside of an MFT file record itself, which is the case for 13cubed.txt. It's only about 60 bytes or so. So for a resident file, this is expected to be zero for the allocated size. In fact, the real size, which we'll look at in a minute, will also end up being zero. If this had been, say, a 7K file, it will require two clusters at the default cluster size or 8192 bytes, meaning that it would be a multiple of two of the default NTFS cluster size. All right, so let's talk about the real size. And again, as I mentioned, it's zero and that's expected for a resident file. In my example for the 7K file, this would actually reflect the true size of the file, the 7K. Whereas again, the allocated size would be a multiple of the NTFS cluster size. All right, so the next thing to talk about is the actual file name itself, which in this case is 13cubed.txt. And you'll see it there with every other character being a dot or in hex 00, a null byte. That's because this is UTF-16. Before we talk about that though, check out the two bytes in front of the file name, starting with 0B. This value represents the file name length in characters. 0B converted to decimal is 11, and if you add up 13cubed period txt, that is indeed 11 characters or 11 bytes. The next value, 03, is the file name namespace. You could see the potential values on screen that this could be, but 03 is a common value to see here. Let's go back to the file name itself. And just a reminder, this is obviously going to vary in length based upon the length of the file name itself. So the bytes you see highlighted in red there are obviously going to be a variable length depending on the length of the file name itself. Next up, the data section, perhaps the most important section in the file record, or one of them anyway, 8000000. For a resident file, the actual contents of the file itself will be stored in this area, which is the case here. For a non-resident file, this is going to contain a list of the clusters on disk from which to retrieve and reassemble that file. But here I'm highlighting the actual contents. Hello, I'm a resident file. Also, please subscribe to 13 cubes. So that's literally the contents of the file itself that I typed into Visual Studio Code and saved into the text file. But again, if it's non-resident, it's going to be a cluster run where the operating system knows where to go on disk to grab the contents of the file to reassemble it. And that leaves us with two remaining things. The EA information section starts with D0000000. And this refers to extended attribute information. Next, we have E0000000, which is the actual start of the extended attributes. In this case, this particular file has two such extended attributes, and I'll highlight them here. The first is kernel purge sec file hash, which you see here. And the second extended attribute relates to data loss prevention, and you can see it right here, kernel sec endpoint DLP. I debated as to whether or not I wanted to include these, but because this particular file did end up having two extended attributes, I figured I would point them out. And that takes us to the end. So with that, let's go back to the start of the MFT file record, 
And you can see again the 4649 4C 45 signature. This is back where we started. And as I mentioned, we didn't cover every single section here, but we did hit all of what I consider to be the most important sections within a file record. So hopefully if you take a look at, a, at an MFT, for example, in your own home lab, and then follow along with this episode, you can pick out these structures as well. A couple of things to note, this is a file name that is not considered a long file name. With a long file name, we would obviously end up having two sets of file name attributes, right? One for the long name and one for the short name. But in this case, there isn't actually a long and short file name, if that makes sense. But other than that, the only other thing that this doesn't represent is a non-resident file because our example is showing you a resident file. But if you take a look at this in your own lab environment, you'll see obviously plenty of examples and you will at least be able to read the structure of one of these file records or file entries now that you've watched this episode, or at least that's the hope. All right, with all of that out of the way, that wraps up what I wanted to cover in this episode. I hope you found this information useful and enlightening. And as always, I'd like to thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.